Welcome back to the PC Perspective Podcast. We've reached episode 679. This is being recorded on the 1st of June, 2022. I'm Sebastian Peek. I'm Jeremy Hellstrom. I'm Josh Walrath. I'm Brett Van Spruenberg. And I'm Kent Burgess. You can help support this site and our podcast distribution by going to patreon.com slash pcper. We want to thank new patron Spidey this week. Thank you, Spidey. We could not do it without mm-hmm. you. And everyone, thank you all. It's time for our most important segment of the week, Food with Josh, a.k.a. Burger of the Week, Laramie, Wyoming. Josh, take it away. All right. So let me oh, let me, uh, let me bring up the board on this one. It was, uh, it was uh, shockingly tasty. I wasn't sure how it would come out, but it's called the Green Machine. So if, if those, uh, you know, who uh, enjoy 70s, Movies, wait, that's that's Mean Machine, right? Anyway, Green Machine, uh, the Green Machine, mm-hmm. a double burger topped with jalapenos, shredded cheddar, and pork green chili. This was nicely done. There was a lot of uh, cheddar on the burger, as you well can see. Uh, but under that cheddar is the green chili. And, of course, topped with jalapenos. This is a messy burger, so it had to be eaten with a fork and a knife. Um, you know, the, the beef flavors were not covered up by, even though the beef is covered up by all that stuff. The flavors were, you know, were just popping. Everything was complimentary. It wasn't overly done. Yeah, that's some, it's some greasy cheese. But, you know, it's, it's finely aged, aged shredded cheddar. So, uh I had a great time eating that one. I'm still full. And someone screaming in the background while I'm doing my burger review. It's so popular. Let's move on to the news. And our top story has to be the article that we just, we couldn't quite talk about this last week because in between recording the podcast and publishing the edited version of the podcast, AMD decided to change or I don't even know how to describe this. Well, they, they, they corrected information. It didn't fit on the slide. Come on. <laughs> See, I, I fixed their slide for them here. Um, so when they said up to 170 watts and then were very specific with media, this is PPT. It's like peak power target or whatever that stands for. Package power tracking. Okay. The direct quote from AMD, Paul Alcorn. The AMD socket AM5 platform supports infrastructure groups up to 170 watts. PPT. So that was the official word on May 23. The 170 figure given by AMD was PPT, not TDP. And then AMD comes out three days later and says, no, it's actually up to 230 watts PPT. And that 170 watt is a TDP. So the part that they showed on stage at 5.5 gigahertz was probably a 170 watt TDP part. Isn't that amazing? The smaller we get, the 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 higher the TDPs. There was yeah. kind of a golden <clears throat> age there for a little bit, <clears throat> where you know Intel their their top part was sixty five, sixty seven watts, because you know they didn't need to really go past that because there was no competition. And then they jumped that up to like seventy seven watts, and then eighty seven, and. Then over a hundred, and <clears throat> now they're sitting, you know, officially one thirty with you know pulling two thirty, uh, PPT. I guess you would call that, though they probably call it something different than AMD. And now we're at the point where you know it's a five nanometer part. Uh, they're hugely complex. They're pushing um, billions and billions of transistors, and uh, you know materials and that kind of stuff has just not kept up. So while we're, you know, optimizing for density and they are optimizing <clears throat> for power and thermals and all of that, it's just they're becoming so complex. You've got to apply a lot of power to all of those billions of transistors, no matter how much gating you're doing and other things. I mean, if you want to hit performance targets that are comparable to the competition or, you know, at least where you think competition is going to be. You, you've got to push that envelope. And now that envelope's getting pretty ragged. I'm sure we'll talk more about this 
in the coming months when we finally have CPUs <clears> available. <throat> but let's move on to Intel. Equal time here on the PC Pro Podcast. Intel's Falcon Shores XPU. Don't call it an APU. It's an XPU. Because, you know, it has X E. Oh, graphics. I get it now. Yeah. Yes. It has greater than five times performance per watt. I don't know what they're comparing that to. Greater than a Pentium 2. I'm not sure what that means. But uh, there's probably some tiny print somewhere. Performance <laughs> targets based on estimates relative to current platforms in February 2022. Okay. Yeah, so like NVIDIA's A100. Uh, that seems to be what they're Intel going for. Platforms? No, they're no. Oh. That's competition they're talking about. Oh, okay, that would be big if that's the case. It certainly would. <clears throat> Ponte Vecchio. So I, I do appreciate that this is easier to pronounce than Ponte Vecchio or Vecchio or however you're supposed <laughs> to which, pronounce that. How how is that pronounced? Okay, I guess I don't know. No, Vecchio. Mm. Ponte Vecchio. Ponte Vecchio. Hmm. I don't know. Mm, one of those sounded mm. Canadian. The other sounded American. Mm. Is there is there a story here, Jeremy? No. no. Or do you mean about uh, Falcon oh, Shores? This. Yes, this. please. Yes. <laughs> I okay. thought you were talking about pronunciation here. Uh, so, <laughs> no, the XPU is a little different from the APU in that Intel is planning on selling it as more of a package so you can decide how many CPU cores you want and how many XE cores you want up to the point where if you actually want it, it could be just pure CPU or pure GPU. So I don't know if that's so much of a skew thing or if they're actually really planning on making individual broken out packages because this is for HPC. Like this is for the big guys. Uh, You're not gonna be slapping this in anything short of a gigantic supercomputer anytime soon. So the idea that they could actually, you know, customize it to that level seems interesting and, you know, okay, that's a little bit different from an APU, but at the same time, we don't know. And we're just barely seeing Ponte Vecchio hitting now. Like it's just sort of coming up. Uh, One of the first ones is a supercomputer at uh, Argonne National Laboratory. And this is the next generation afterwards. So is it, it, we're going to have to see how the, the design of their current stuff in HBM 2E that they've incorporated into it compares with what's currently on the market. Because by the time this comes around, of course, NVIDIA is already going to have their next generation out. AMD is certainly getting much more into the HPC market. Uh, ARM, you know, it's is doing their own thing and, and moving solidly forward for that. So if what Intel is saying with those five times improvements... Uh, this would be, you know, absolutely amazing. There'd be no question of buying it unless the prices are obscene and more than five times, which th- they're probably not going to be. I don't know. It's it's going to be interesting because you're, you're counting on HBM3, which we haven't really seen in market. Uh, they're talking about PCIe 4, 5.0 and 6.0 support, which we don't have on market, but the, the theoretic, theoretical numbers all add up. So it's going to be interesting to see sort of how this comes out over the next couple of because it's this is not coming out by the end of the year this will be you know sometime next year 2024 in the meantime though it's 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 showing that you know we're, we're changing how a lot of computing is doing nvidia or intel is really doing this you know efficiency core power core and uh you know really pushing xe which i, I really hope to meet someday is more than just you know a, a low cost thing to add on to a laptop processor you know, what's really interesting about a lot of this, and this was a discussion brought up on, on Twitter. <clears throat> when they put these complex chips together, um, the yield rate really kind of hurts it bad because you can't easily remove these chips from the substrates that they're bonded to. And so, so you've got all these good chips and you do the manufacturing to, to bond, bond them on their substrates, you know, whatever they want to call it, whether it's, you know, direct to the PCB um, or the EMIB type stuff. Um, if any of those fail, you have a useless chip on your hand and you have 
nine or 12 pieces of perfectly good silicon that you're just throwing away. And so there's, there are some obvious advantages because you can create a very, very large chip. Of course, the phone has to ring right in the middle of a rant. The bad thing is, is that, of course, you throw all these perfectly good chips away. And there's a reason why these products are as high margin as they are, because you're throwing a lot of really good chips away that you could use. And so certainly, yeah, you, you can't, you know, do a single die uh, with stuff this size. I mean, you could in theory, but it gets really kind of sketchy and yields are even worse than having EMID mounting problems. So yeah, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's a great idea on paper and for the very high end, it's still a very good idea because you can adjust these really high end margins to be able to handle the loss of silicon and the loss of these entire packages. So it's a balance. It's, it's something that, you know, we, we will see at the lower end with, you know, up to like five chips, maybe six, depending on different uh, categories. Um, but, you know, also in, in, in the future, uh, they're going to get this technology down a little bit better. So, I mean, chiplets, they are the future. They're, they're where we're at right now. I mean, if you've got an AMD Ryzen processor that is not a mobile or APU, then you've got chiplets, but it's all on, you know, at least on that as a, uh, a PCB scrub substrate, an organic substrate uh, versus EMIB or uh, uh, having a full silicon interposer. So sorry to derail with a rant, but there are challenges ahead with uh, all of the ways that, uh, that they're going with this. Shall we move on? Mm-hmm. Moving. All right. Mm, Since okay. we're talking about Intel, some very exciting developments in Intel Arc desktop graphics. I know we like to touch on this at least once a week because there's so much going on and it's, it's hard to keep track of all of it. I don't want to just kind of save it up until launch, but um, the latest is that Intel, they've entered the game. Arc for desktop. It, wait, no, then the next day they're like, no, it, that was a mistake. So I took it down. Video cards had the scoop here. Oops. And uh, the, the, It's lag. They thought they'd join the game, but the lag is so bad that, you know, they just Yeah, can't they were really on Stadia. They're like, it. oh, damn it. Yeah. Okay. That was published on the 28th. So uh, nothing new since then, except that no longer is there any reference to it on it, uh, the website. In actual news, VMware... Wait, who bought who? VMware, Broadcom, Broadcom bought something VMware. happened. Yeah, Broadcom for a buttload of money. Who owned VMware Zillions. before? One million. Everyone. Okay. <laughs> oh, it's just a public trade. VMware is a little bit. Uh, yeah, it's it's been around a bit. Oh, that's right. It was Dell who owned it before. Yeah. What okay. else is Broadcom owning? I see you're mentioning a technological Swiss Army knife. What else are they? What else do they have their hands in? Besides chips, Wi-Fi chips, networking. Uh, I mean, like they did some containerization stuff. Uh, they did. I never. I've never run into Heptio before. Pivotal, which you, you might have heard of before, where that's you know, I, a bunch of consultants come in, swoop in, and say, you know, all of your kit's got to go. You got to buy this brand new stuff. It'll be wonderful. Here's a gigantic that's any bill. Consultant. That's oh, and, and here's the bill for the hardware. Uh, the hardware bill's <laughs> over there. This is just my bill. Oh, uh, oh. But that was one of their tools for doing that. And, of course, Broadcom would be looking at the infrastructure side of it and saying, hey, you know, let's integrate our stuff in so that the tool actually has it as, you know, the recommended stuff. Uh, so it's, it's weird because Broadcom has always been sort of the hardware guy's. Mm-hmm. Even any of the purchasing they did was more to sell their hardware. So to grab VMware, which is just pure virtualization, seems a little odd, but at the same time, everything's a service now. So if Broadcom wanted to start looking at hardware as a service type stuff, that would make sense because now all of a sudden you're time sharing on the the fiber interconnects you've got going or your time sharing on some of the networking gear that they're running 
so you don't have to pay for the entire chunk. You're just, you know, pairing for your virtualized uh, instance of it. Other than that, this just baffles me. I don't get it. Is is this, are you suggesting this? This is uh, virtualization, you know, virtual networking on your virtual hardware. I mean, that has to be the next step, right? That your virtual software uh, is running on. I, I you're selling people virtual hardware now. I mean, I it, it's service I, I, as a service. Okay. All right. It's beyond hardware as a service. We're operating system as a, it's just service as a service. S O S. Wait, no, SAS. SAS. Yeah. Service, but you can't call it that because that's already taken. Oh. Uh, other than that, I don't understand Nonsense. what they're thinking. And you don't toss around $61 billion just for LARFs unless you're a certain uh, evil genius or at Listen, least evil master. You wonder what Broadcom's identity is. Obviously, they're the company that owns VMware. That's their product. That's their identity. <laughs> don't worry about the past. Do you, know, yeah. do you know how many people use VMware? George. George Orwell. I mean, it's, a lot it's of people. Billion. Oh, man. It's just, you know, it, 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 my group, we, we have many vmware licenses and mm-hmm. we pay a lot for it but you know it it kind of pays for itself because you know we've got hardware that is so dense so many threads so much memory all of that it doesn't make sense to run just a single os on a lot of these machines that you get for oh, no. ten thousand mm-hmm. dollars sure i mean that's going to be you know 10 10 grand will get you two epic processors with 48 plus threads, um, 128 gigs plus um, memory, and then, you know, at least six terabytes worth of of storage. And you run a variety of Linux and Microsoft-based products on top of that, and you do it very, very well. And they have the management that they have for it. I mean, you have a couple of, of hosts around there. You can easily... Uh, transfer these VMs uh, to other machines in just like an instant. Um, oh, yeah. Or change their parameters uh, relatively it, quickly. It, oh, yeah. It, yeah. It's, it makes, it's, it's, it makes it's, deployments it's, scalable. So you can do the same so thing over and over easy again. and yeah. scalable yeah. and redundant. Mm-hmm. And yeah, it just depends on how much you want to pay them for uh, what products. And but <laughs> they just make it very, very easy to deploy across medium large size businesses yeah, yeah it well yeah. broadcom's got a plan to make 61 billion back on this so i see a Somehow. subscription model you know maybe changing well, in the future or or becoming tiered yeah and optimize it to run on broadcom hardware and let's just say optimized you know. yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah financially that's optimized. what we like that's what the companies <laughs> like to use nowadays financially optimized <laughs> Yes, we're, leverage, we're leveraging the power of the blockchain to <laughs> that'll be in there somewhere across the board. <laughs> All right. Quickly. Next, we had a story on the list from our friends at the FPS review who was looking at a uh, very flashy looking kind of cyberpunk inspired motherboard design from Biostar Tron. It Tr- looks that's like exactly it. what it's, I was thinking. Tron. It's, it's yep. GTA, Tron. though, You're isn't right. that Grand Theft You're Auto? Right, but this it totally is. looks like Tron. I mean, look at that. It does. Mm-hmm. Greater Tron Authority. Ah. Makes sense. That's the ones in charge of the speed bikes. Or the white bikes, yeah. if you want to call them that. So this is an well, example. Look at this. It's um, even drawn like the Tron. The box picture looked like the speeder bikes. Or the light cycles. They couldn't afford the licensing, so uh, it's a GTA. I bet those two uh, chipset fans sort of sound like the Tron light cycles as well. Yep. Uh Anyway, this is a Z690 motherboard from Biostar, and it takes DDR4 memory. So, yeah, that take advantage of that ultra affordable, high speed, low latency DDR4 stuff that's so readily available everywhere. And I'm not being sarcastic, actually. For once, it is. <laughs> look at the look at the output on this board. You've got to love DVI. You've got to love boards like this. This wow. if you're if you're listening to the podcast, it has DisplayPort, HDMI, DVI output. It has USB and PS2 for your peripherals. Hey, PS2 in in a, in a way was actually better than USB for certain inputs because mm-hmm. it's interrupt it's interrupt driven hey, versus you're Rob preaching Robin. to the choir, Brett. <laughs> PS2 <laughs> is better always. It, it it yes, it is. It is better. Let's see. What's uh, I'm, I went too far. CPU power. 
it is it is not uh fun to try to benchmark one motherboard against another no it's pretty boring. monstrous differences yeah so they put it against a maximus z690 extreme from asus or asus or asus 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 we could have Asus. an entire podcast on just the pronunciation of this. <laughs> uh, and it looks like it's just a little bit behind, as one would expect. But um, the cost, though, I mean, these are really close. What is the value proposition of this? I'm assuming it's a little bit cheaper than a, yeah, $319. And the, so. uh, the Z690 Extreme that that was being tested against is a DDR5 motherboard. Oh, as well. okay. All right. Yeah. I'm dumb, of course. There is very little difference. Ask about that. I should have actually looked at their test setup, but uh, I did not for some reason. Probably because I'm a, mm. not good at this. Yeah, Dumal. Yeah, yes. They used Trident Z Royal 3600 Cast 16. And then, okay, here's these. There you uh, go. Da, 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 try and see Dan, there you 6, go. 6,000 cast 36 for the. Um, so that's pretty good stuff. Max makes us yeah, yeah, so some even of with the, the better DDR5 advantage. out there. Well, yes. And look at the huge difference it makes in performance. <laughs> exactly. I think Jeremy posted an article <clears throat> a few weeks ago that was showing the minimal differences between DDR4 and 5 on similar yeah. systems. And that's a that's still the only comparison I've seen. I, I it, it's almost like uh, people aren't wanting to go down that road of comparing the two. Um, with a mind to doing this, I bought with my own money a Gigabyte Z690 DDR4 board on Amazon a little while back. I was planning on doing a bunch of comparison testing with DDR4 versus DDR5 with the same CPU, same graphics card, and it has not. Um, I've not done this yet. So if there's enough interest, maybe I will get to that. But anyway, let's move on to another exciting topic. One that's hotly debated at all times. You know, the right time to buy a GPU. Is it now? Are prices going to continue to drop? Is Bitcoin going to pick up steam again? A video cards posted something on the 30th of May. NVIDIA and AMD graphics cards on their way to MSRP. <gasps> well, I feel like it uh. hit kind of a lull in the price drops, though. I well, yeah, tend I mean, to agree. How much further can they really go? I mean, we we are seeing at the top end, uh, like 3090s go for about 100 bucks below MSRP. But when you start getting a little lower than that, I mean, you know, we had that little blip where MSI had the 12 gig 3080 for just a little bit more than a regular 3080. But yeah, I mean, it is definitely slowed down. Uh, we're seeing small sales here and there. And again, at the high end, we, we see a little bit more leeway in that because it has softened up pretty dramatically. But yeah, I don't know if we're going to see a whole lot of uh, drops from here on out. Maybe in late June, we'll get some yeah. just because we're expecting the, not the release, but the announcement of the next generation of graphics. And that always tends to get people a little excited about getting rid of some of their surplus uh, products in the channel. I I mentioned this earlier, but uh, in all fairness, I need, need to admit that I've been keeping track of certain pricing for some AMD GPUs on um, Micro Center. And recently, the price went up. I'm a little bit surprised by that. I was tracking some 6800 XTs, a couple of different ones, MSI, Gigabyte ones, hovering around 800. They just jumped up to 11. And nine. I'm a little surprised by that. Sure, what's going on? Mm. Maybe, Maybe availability is. Well, you know, they're not making them anymore, right? Right? Not making them? All oh, they've gone to the 50 what, series? The... So, 6800 XT, for instance, not being made. Am I right? It's not where, even on the website anymore. This verified. I don't remember seeing this officially anywhere. Well, it's yeah, not I didn't come out and said it's EOL. I don't believe no. they have, no. No, no, it's, it's, it's still being made because. You know, we, we haven't heard a whole lot about NVIDIA. We've heard even less about AMD's next generation RDNA 3. And so... Is sure it's, sure it's still being made? It's not on their site anymore. 
The 6800 XT or the 6800? 6800 XT. Yeah, it's still being made. As far as I'm known. Hmm. Mm-hmm. Now the 6800? Mm, no. Let's see. They're getting rid of that one. Are they still Okay, they still have it on their site, I see. But I was checking their check availability. I just did this a little while ago. Let's see. 6750... 6950. I mean, obviously, those are new. 6950s, brand new. Whoa. But yeah, the 6800 is is now kind of being overshadowed by the 6750. And so yeah. they're just throwing that into the trash bin of history and going yeah. with the 6750. You can pick up one of those Speedster Merc 319 RX 6800 XTs for the same 799. That hasn't changed since Josh's review yeah. went up. The 6900 XT of that uh, XFX card had been 899, but it's back up to, I think, 1049 on Newegg now. Uh, yeah, the price see. has jumped. Now, how come the 6800 XT is not in the AMD store? That inventory yeah, they, changes. They, they, I, think, I think AMD's really cutting back on what they're offering. And they probably have stopped making the reference versions of the 6800, 6800 XT. That and, makes sense. Uh, 6700. Okay. That, that makes sense. Okay. Whoa. 1349? Neep. For the speed streamer. Yeah. I, I, you know, it may be with all the prices that dropped as much as they did, there, was, there was potentially a rush on these cards. And we're seeing just a. A pop up. I don't know. Well, EVGA about two weeks ago had, do- I'm not kidding, dozens of cards in stock. And I just looked on their website, and the only card they're showing in stock right now is the 3080 10 gig for the Win 3. Yeah. So, 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 so yeah, I mean, there, 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 there is going to be some, moving. there's going to be some ebb and flow because the, you know, as, yeah to msrp people will grab it up we also have to deal with you know the lockdowns in china where they produced a lot of these cards uh that's going to affect uh availability so i don't it know just ended today by the way really the lockdown mm-hmm. in china yeah well, no. well sebastian's seeing more than i saw but still yeah if you want to get a hybrid model or a liquid cooled model apparently those are available Okay, we have. Oh, whoa, whoa. Oh, wow, there's no oh, kinds of them. 689? Is this a refurb? Oh, nope. 3070 oh, in yeah. stock for 689, though. Good lord. <clears throat> I would <throat> never. I can't. I know, but still. Uh, I swear these prices were lower. <laughs> when I did that, uh, when I was at yeah. 869, that was the. Okay, I'm looking at the difference between a 10 gig versus 12 gig version of the 3080 okay but that look at the price difference good god 1149 is that an hbm uh, <laughs> an extra two gigs freaking hbm <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so it's partitioned sorry it's partitioned off and it runs ah, at right. half the speed so i don't know why i must have clicked just 3080 but i thought i clicked all cards they have no list all right, moving on to something important. The throwback segment of the show. Yes, Amiga emulation. Now, we already have solid Amiga emulation on computers, but here's another option that claims to be totally cross-platform. Ami kit. Ami kit? I'm guessing if it's Amiga, would it be Ami? It's A-M-I-K-I-T. However, that's mm-hmm. pronounced. More than just your average emulator, writes Jeremy Hellstrom. At PCPro.com. Full HD, 32-bit screen modes? Did your Amiga yeah, do Amiga that? OS 3. 2, and Amiga OS 3.2 and Amiga OS 4. Very, very now interesting. Is that, does it have generic um, ROMs for those? Or do we need to provide dubiously legal ROMs <laughs> to run these? The uh, kernel will automatically appear, apparently. Oh, okay. Okay. What is the other one called? I have it set up on my Windows computer. It's uh, UAF. F S U A E is the current standard as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, when you want to play Shadow of the Beast. All right, here's the one that I use, which is also cross platform F S U A E. And it also has like the generic 
uh, cores if you don't have like a system ROM file. And it works very well. It's a little bit, I mean, this is, I, I don't see a larger view here. Is it a Vantilius fault fonts on it? Um, I don't know, but setting up a game is kind of a pain because you got to like manually go in and load individual images in your virtual floppy drives and but you can set the Amiga model that you want and you can tweak settings and things and works quite well has full screen windowed options does nice. it have a uh, rabbit hole that you can launch to lo get you back into your base OS from within no, Amiga no I don't think so I always have to just reset this the whole does. thing I just wonder what the basis of this new project is well it's not new Oh, okay. This one's been around for a while. It's just this is a, a new major release. Before they were having issues with uh, the Raspberry that they're not now. Maybe it's like Open EMU modern just the interface modern is, retro is nicer. sixty four bit. You know. Okay. Oh, sixty four bit architecture. and preciser. Okay. Yes, more oh. more precise. Preciser. Uh. All right. So. Hey, English is hard. Be English majors to design good. I, okay. And if you want the Vampire V2 kit, yeah, you can actually screw around with that. Oh, eight, A500 Mini was finally released here in the US, apparently, according to G Shack 3. Oh, finally. Is it just as overpriced for the US market as it was mm. for the rest Tradition. Of the okay. Not that I'm salty about it, because I wanted to buy it, and then I thought, I cannot. It's just, it's just another Raspberry Pi emulator thing mini console should be fifty dollars <laughs> let's see what it is on amazon right now okay it is more than fifty dollars hundred and forty dollar yep hmm. that is too much oh the mouse <laughs> the mouse electronic mm -hmm. games twenty nine twenty two See, if the C64 Mini is $40. The A500 Mini is $140. There seems to be a little bit of a problem here. They just Maybe they, they got the... There's like a template formatting error. That one's not supposed to be there. <laughs> I think I would pay... F up. To, I think if it was $79.99, I would be tempted. The A500 one looks cooler. Okay, I hear seventy nine ninety nine. Do I hear any? Do I hear eighty two, eighty two thirty eight? No. Trying to find any Raspberry Pi right now is nearly impossible. Oh, and so it, it disappeared. It makes it makes sense that something yeah. like this is I also see. hard to find. No, well, they disappeared back in October or so of last year, completely, pretty much. Yeah. All right. How about a feel-good story from Jeremy about NASA's ingenuity? Well, and, you know, the Mars Flight Simulator trailer, because there, oh. you can actually watch the recording of it bombing around on its 25th flight. Now, I mean, it's sort of amazing to think that our Martian helicopters made 25 flights, but see, the thing is, they were hoping for about four <laughs> so this is pretty amazing. Um, and they're, they're already planning a 29th. And the other thing is that back uh, at the beginning of last month, it stopped talking. Perseverance was no longer talking back to Ingenuity uh, because the solar panels went got covered enough that it couldn't charge the batteries. Now, this is kind of bad, not just because you need that little tiny bit of power to keep things going, but needs a defroster to run overnight so it doesn't freeze solid and by losing power or at least losing one of the last bits of uh, things to go, which is communication up to the mothership, there was some serious concerns that that was it. She was toast, you know, mind you, significantly longer after it was uh, supposed to have died, but it, it didn't. But the thing came back. But and now here, here, if you've ever had to deal with someone whose CMOS clock just refuses to reset, how about trying to do it from Mars? Because that was the thing, is that the uh, time, the clock on it stopped. So it no, no longer knew accurately what time night started so that it had to shut down, go into power saving mode and clank up the heaters. And so, yeah, with a good, at 
best two megabits a second, they had to figure out how to program the damn thing, get it to reset its RTC so that everything else could function properly off of the Martian day night cycle. I'm glad I wasn't on that call. There's some pretty smart people that work for NASA. Pretty patient too. Click. Hey, let's go for coffee. Come back. We'll see if it responds with a <laughs> yes. <laughs> Can it really be time already in our show for gaming quick hits? It is. Yes. Thank the it Lord. can. Let's talk about, you know, Elden Ring. People are talking about Elden Ring. Somebody there. that I know was talking to me about Elden Ring the other day. And I, I'm like, no, I haven't played it. I don't know anything about it. I don't care to. I asked you guys a couple weeks ago. You guys said, no, no, I'm not playing it. I don't know care, it But... Sounds it's hard. already a competitor. Steel Rising. Okay, it says Souls like. Does that mean that Elden Ring is a Souls style? Correct. Kind of, it, yes. yes. Kind of. Okay. Okay. But what do you mean, kind of? It's, it's the same people behind it all. It is oh, the same. It is the same guy. people. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Except they added George R. R. Martin. So, because yeah. he needs other things to do other than write wins a winner. Which he's still <laughs> not doing. Yeah. Is he still writing on like a DOS uh, word? word I don't even. I don't no, he's got all the other series and the comics and that movie theater that he's keeping running and still making like a million million was... bucks an episode. So, yeah, he's working. I liked him better when he was writing the wild card series long, long, long ago. Yeah. One of, my, one of my favorite series. I think he's still tossing into that, or at least managing editor. Oh, he does edit. He, really? He does edit. And, yeah. Huh. Because yeah. that isn't over yet. any new ones. Uh, not in a couple of years, but yeah, there's a huge amount. Oh, this is a scary Cro- looking Croyd. porcelain doll person. in this. No, area. that's a robot with a powdered wig. Okay. And that's actually who you're playing. So yeah, it's, it's the 1700s. It's the French Revolution in a... Uh, Parallel universe where Louis the Fourteenth, uh, or sorry, Louis the Sixteenth, decided to put down the revolution with his robot autonomous army, and you are a member of the proletariat that wants to get rid of the royalty and uh, have to fight the robot minions to do so. As you can see, there's a little more firearms in it than your average Souls like game, and they they did try and make. Uh, a, a mode where it's a little less nasty. So if people wanted to experience it, but don't have the time or energy to get good, they should still be able to enjoy this. Oh, so journalists, is it the journalist mode? Yeah, it's good, something like that. Yeah. Get, get good. Dad mode. Uh, and, you know, same sort of di- idea where you've got huge, gigantic bosses sort of camping out in their areas. When you kill things, you get something that's totally not a soul or uh, whatever, which gives you extra powers uh, or, you know, extra health. They've got uh, the same sort of health thing, uh, health and stamina, where you've got to time your movement right or you get too low on stamina, you can't do anything, you got to drink your health potions because something sneezed at you and now you've got three hit points left. But the other thing they've done is add in a grappling hook. Mm. So, you know, it, I don't know how many people know much about Paris, but like there's a lot of balconies and verticals in there. So the idea is that you'll be able to do that. And then as you get further on in the game, you'll get extra powers to let you Metroidvania it a little bit. And so you can go back to old areas and jump around a little bit further than you could have if you enjoy that sort of thing. I don't know. It's it's tough to come out with uh, a Souls-like game at the same time that one's already been, you know, hugely popular. But this one is different enough that maybe it's going to survive? Maybe. Assassin's Creed uh, 4 with with robots. Yeah. And a bit more heavy on the apocalypse. Unity? Was that Assassin's Creed Unity? Was that that title? I believe it was. Yes, it took place in Paris. God of War now has an AMD FSR 2.0 support patch. It's the, wait for it, third game to welcome AMD's up, updated upscaler. So there is now a stable of some three games 
that enjoy the enhanced benefits. Yep. And I I'm say, honestly, I feel like the oh, rollout sorry, for uh, DLSS updates is faster. From a news perspective, that was it. That was designed to be a quick hit. I, yes, I thought you'd appreciate it. it. That, that yep. was it. Download the update Three games. today. And then finally, it wouldn't be gaming quick hits without us fawning over some humble bundle. And here we go. True. It's the City Skylines Colossal Collection. 32 games for $20. I know. It's good well, one anything. game. It's just got a lot oh, of Skylines to it. Now. DLCs. Oh, DLCs. Okay. Uh-huh. Well, it's it's one of those games that lives off the DLC. Well, right. Like, like The Sims. Wait, just pay $20. I think it's... Yeah, kind of like pay what you want kind of thing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, I think that Skylines is much like Sim where, yeah, here's 32 DLCs. That gives you about one third of the available ones. Uh, All right. Security. Speaking security of VMware. Begins. Yeah. Guess what else Broadcom bought? <laughs> <laughs> okay. That's not fair. <laughs> hey, they were being held for ransom at the time. They had no choice but to buy it. Sheer script. Double extortion malware. This sounds exciting researchers at trend micro have discovered some new linux based ransomware that's being used to attack vmware is it xc xi yes i always pronounce the letters yeah. i just pronounce the letters yeah. yeah they're they're one of the more uh you know business like people so it's esxi it is vmware of course no you know broadcom remember this was a container for m- many other virtual machines okay so the the wedge here is that it allowed them to encrypt all of them. So there there could be, you know, tens or hundreds of VMs on here that they just locked. And this is where the ransomware, of course, comes in, where they say, "Oh, oh, you you want you know your hundred servers back, and you know for your hundred different clients that are crawling up your butt, screaming at you. Well, you know that'll be a hundred thousand dollars, please. Here's our here's our Bitcoin wallet." But uh, let's not forget that, of course, you know, they're, they're leveraging the power of the blockchain. So, Obviously. Yes. Why wouldn't they? Hmm. It's the future. It's the present. It's very now. All right. Now, it's, I, it's I didn't really, really understand this now. double, this double yes. extortion technique, what they call, we hack your company successfully. All files have been stolen. If you want to restore your files and avoid leaks, please contact us. Uh, oh, they hold the private key, need to decrypt it. Isn't that just regular extortion? Anytime yeah, you just well, yeah, like but they've you... added a protection racket to it. Oh, I see. Okay. Oh, that now I get it. Okay, that makes sense. Nice. Shame if that data disappeared again now, wouldn't it be? Yeah, now we'll make sure that no one else can hack you. Speaking of vulnerabilities. Zero day vulnerability. I'm guessing that's what Voln is short for. Hey, and Microsoft hey, Office. Lena. Aren't you? You're, you got to be hip to read that as Voln. Zero day Voln. Zero day Voln at the mm, register. Yes. Richard Speed wrote this article. Updated InfoSec researchers have identified a zero day code execution vulnerability in Microsoft's ubiquitous Office software. Dubbed Felina. The vulnerability Felina. has been floating. The Voln has been floating around for a <laughs> while. So uh, back to April. I, I mean, you can honestly refer to Microsoft support diagnostic tool as also just sort of a, a baked in virus because. It'll just come back and say, well, we couldn't find what was wrong. Yeah, sorry. Problem is that the, it it runs uh, at an elevated level uh, and makes a call to another section of Windows. And so they figured out a way uh, that if you sort of carefully craft uh, a specific type of uh, Office file and you do it, when someone opens it or... If you're one of those bloody lunatics that likes to have Explorer with preview on, so you just float over a file and it shows you in the preview pane, well, guess what? You're infected. Isn't that nice? <laughs> Don't make attachments or hover your mouse over them either. And they essentially said that, well, um, as long as you have the trusted execution policy going uh, in, in Windows so you only can launch things from trusted sources, it's going to block it. So we're not going to make it a security vulnerability. We're going to make it, you know, a defect. And they were right to an extent in that no one exploited it until, well, now they have. And something that could have been fixed a while ago was not. Now, literally all you have to, what it is 
at its heart is, is an URL handler, specifically a Microsoft URL handler from within the OS to Office 365 with elevated privileges because why wouldn't you give an URL handler elevated privileges? That's just common sense, right? You can literally kill it with a single registry change. Uh, and, you know, we've been arguing about that in my day job as to whether, you know, is it worth doing this and, you know, finding the one idiot that's absolutely in love with the troubleshooter, to which I pointed out, well, you can still launch those. If you've completely gone bar me and, and want to go and launch Windows Help Center, it'll still go. It just breaks the URL handler. It doesn't break anything else. And you export the registry key so that eventually when Microsoft fixes it, you can just import it back in and people can have their little cookie back again. So yeah, it's scary. It's awful. And seriously, just do a quick Google. Uh, there's one registry change. All it does is make those annoying troubleshooters go away and make it completely invulnerable. Eventually a patch there's will a, come out. I'm sure. There's a post that says um, you can you can go to the um, Microsoft Defenders attack uh, surface reduction and make sure that Office is not allowed to create any child processes. So block all child processes from Office. That except post to mitigate it. Oh, there's an exception. Hmm. Uh -oh. You can't block Explorer from creating child processes. Nah, we were talking about Office. So if you're in preview mode in Explorer yeah, and you hover over an Office document and it shows up in go. that preview pane, <gasps> You're infected. Newman. So yes, <laughs> well, Defender is better. Should. Yeah, not necessarily perfect. We buried the lead, our top story tonight. Leanne Lee, O11D, or Dynamic Mini. It's a case from Leanne Lee. And look at this build. Nice. Look at the lighting. Oh, sweet. So, look so at the nice. purple like accents on the wall. I added about a 30% vignette to this as well to make it look more like a spotlight. Kent, nice. what do you have to say for yourself? Uh, it's a great case. How how did it take you this long to recognize that? How could you resist the the charisma of Dr. Bauer for this long? Uh, because <laughs> I'm, I'm stubborn and probably a bit stupid. Um. <laughs> I, I considered removing that. Like, why, why would you write that about yourself? I put it in. I'm like, no, I have to respect the author's vision well it, it, like i said you know a lot of people uh, myself included have a desire when they are trying to make something they want it to be personalized and a little different and anybody who's been following uh custom pc builds for the last three years knows that you can't swing a dead cat without hitting an 011 build somewhere um but this is the O11 Dynamic Mini. Uh, it's quite a bit smaller than the uh, original O11 Dynamic, but you can still use up to ATX motherboards in it, even uh, EATX. Um, There's no trickery here. You're not extending it upwards like that one Fantex case. It's just it just no. You're not extending it upwards. Um, you're just uh, changing the position of the. Uh, IO on the back of the case. By the way, and Trooper there's... Beer is really overrated. It's not that good. Oh. I've, oh I have oh, one bottle a... and I've never drank it because be a fight. I don't drink. <laughs> Hold on. So this is this is oh I see the cap is still in place. I'm go back here. So you yeah. just have it because it's Iron Maidens. That's yep. correct. Yes. Yep. Yeah. Sorry. It was Robert, not the best thing we should all know. Mm-mm. If we look very carefully here, if we look, um, Ooh. they have several different ones, and I've heard that they're good thing he's wearing clothes. Called, I know, like that I guy say, with the yeah. teapot. I'm glad you don't photograph things in the nude tent <laughs> because you're, oh, uh, yeah, uh, <laughs> there he is. Uh, well, zoom and enhance. I don't want to enhance. <laughs> yes. Enhance. Why is he holding a banana? Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> so this is one of those dual chamber style cases. It is a dual chamber style case. Um, it, it's a really interesting design, though, with that offset so that it doesn't really make the case that much wider. Yeah. Um, and you still get a lot of usable space in the front. 
Um, the unique design to this one are, is the removable PCI and IO bracket on the rear that yeah. you can just reposition where the rear IO for the motherboard is. This is um, so interesting. So that, sorry to interrupt. It I have yeah. on the screen, there's three different configurations you can look at on the Lian Lee website for this. And you're actually altering the number of expansion slots on the back of the case. There's a seven slot, a five slot, and a three slot configuration. And you're moving like the location of the rear fan, like the exhaust fan mount. You're actually physically altering the back of the case. Mm -hmm. I actually have some photos in there that show the, the different positions. Yeah. Yeah. You have a lot of photos in here, Kent. You went a little crazy with the photos. At one point when I was putting, I was, I had 44 photos and I was just like, what for, why, why are there so many photos? And then I realized, oh, it's a video. This must just be a film strip of video. No, it's just photos. No, nope, it's just photos. This is really cool. And you added photos to what I sent you. I know, because... I know. Cause I'm like, I have to show this. <laughs> Because they have this dual PSU bracket available for this now. You can have redundant power supplies or just use one for like your GPUs and one for the. That's the, yeah. that it's is the, the really the, it, it, that's the one drawback I mentioned in the, the review is that you cannot use an ATX power supply in this case. Um, I really wish you could, because other than that, you could put it. it just about any system you want in there as high powered as you want and still be able to, to cool it adequately um, just because of the airflow design. Um, but Kent, I mean, isn't it kind of antiquated to think that we need such ridiculously high powered power supplies? I mean, that was back. <laughs> wait a minute. Hold on. No, no, sorry. Forget it. Sorry. <laughs> oh, here we go. You need here a power supply pictures. just for your graphics card. So Come here's you one do. Yeah. rear configuration and another. Notice how this has changed up here and there's fewer expansion slots. And then look, a second one of those vintage panels up top, the fan moves down even further and there's only three expansion slots on the bottom. Magic. I bet I could fit an optical drive in there. Ooh, rear facing optical drive. Oh I mean, it's my not God. Small, but Stop it. Mod, it they, they have provided the CAD files for this on their website. So you can go and design something and then just commission Lee and Lee to build it. They do stuff like that. Yeah. You know, look at that easy access to your storage through a rear panel, slide those hard drives out of there. I could put an optical drive in there too. I got two of them in there now. I don't know yeah. if three and a half inch drive bays are wide enough for optical, but I like where your head's at. It's a very clean looking case. It looks like it would be really, really easy to build in because it's so. It wonderful. is. It's a, one of the easiest cases to build in I've ever used. Um, mainly because it, the the front is completely open when you remove the panel. The back is very open. You've got that uh, the spots uh, on the to the right of the motherboard tray, Can which are fully open, and you can pull yeah. the whole I/O out. To, to work in it. So you can basically almost work in it like a like it's a test bench. Um, Have you done the shake test on it? Do things rattle yeah. around? Because you've got a lot of moving parts in there that are just done by screws. Oh, no. When it's, uh, it, when it's in this configuration, it, it does feel a little flimsy, but as soon as you put the rear I.O. back on, it, the whole case just tightens up. Would you stand on it when it's in this open frame configuration? <laughs> no. no. This is steel, no. right? This is predominantly steel. It is steel. Yeah. Okay. So not some. Yeah. What's the shear on those uh, two uh, screws <laughs> at the top post? <laughs> yeah. Not going to mess with it. Although a very handsome looking. Uh, Back panel here. I know it's tempered glass on one side. Nice brush. Is that aluminum? Is that aluminum? It is. It is. The top and back panel are brushed aluminum. Nice. So much intake. This is a very ventilated case, but Leon, they, Leon Lee knows what they're doing. I mean, they made the end case M1. They made the Dan case. Well, once, once they glassed in the front, they, they really 
went the extra mile to give you options to vent from the side or intake from the side, or in this case, as the picture indicates, vent from uh, the bottom, which gives now, you know there's enough clearance as well as um, filters down there. In image 44 here, uh, I can see one of your complaints about the case very clearly. The motherboard cutout only gives you access to half of the CPU. What are we doing wrong here? Oh. Is it supposed to be, is Intel more in the center of this and you used AMD? No, it's, it's just the design of that case. Um, but it, it's really, the, it's almost like they designed it for mini ITX and then said, you know, if we did these couple of things, you could still okay. fit a, a micro ATX or an ATX in here. Um, I think that for stability and rigidity of the case, they couldn't have made that hole any wider. But if you're using a mini ITX motherboard, you, you have full access to that, uh, the CPU socket. But uh, if you're going with a full width motherboard, it's cut in half like you see there. Yeah. All right, let's and talk to about use, and to use micro ATX or ATX motherboards, there's a, a panel that uh, comes with the case that has to be screwed in to extend the tray. Um, gotcha. Yeah, you can see it there. Um, it's not. Look at all those AMD picture. motherboards. <laughs> yeah, got I've so got many. a few. It's time lapse. It's growing. <laughs> <laughs> And changing brands. Yeah. You moved up. You're like, you know what? I started at the We all change over time. Not really. And this isn't mm -hmm. a, um, no offense, Biostar, but it's not a Biostar board. All right. Um, um, how did it perform? You can fit, uh, with micro ATX or mini ITX, you can fit two 360 millimeter radiators and one in the top, one in the bottom and a 240 on the side if you feel you need to. Um, with an ATX, you can still fit a 360 on top, but you have to get the um, offset brackets, which um, are $9. I almost wish Lee and Lee included them, but they came out after the case. I think they didn't believe a lot of people would be wanting to use uh, full-size ATX motherboards in this chassis when they had introduced it. And then when they saw a demand, they just released the offset brackets. I, by the way, we haven't talked about price yet. I feel like this version that you have with the power supply is actually a really good deal. It's, it's a stunning fun. deal. I could not believe Seven. it when I saw it. Is really? that the 750? Is that yeah, the 750? Here's the SP750 yeah. SFX power supply from Lian Lee, which has this nice brushed aluminum here. It's $119 on its own if you go to Newegg right now. The whole case, including that power supply, is $189. Hmm. That's dirt cheap. I was not expecting and, that. And when I ordered it uh, for my friend's son that I'm building the system for, uh, it was $169. So, That's ridiculous. Yeah. It, it's it's a it was a ridiculous deal. Uh, the only difference is if you buy that power supply by itself, it comes with sleeved cables. Um, okay, it and they're like not sleeved if you get the kit. Okay. Um, oh, okay. They're they're sort of flat ribbon style, um, but they still work. And the way the case is designed, they sort of hide pretty well. Yeah, your build was very clean. I'm sure everybody saw the first image i'll pull that up again but just this looks like just your test build which has it's not like a hard line liquid cooling or anything fancy but it's look how clean this is with just regular ribbon cables all in one liquid cooler but what, what are the uh, things that you do with the uh the on the gpu the graphics card are those those evga ones that no those are actually you can get those on amazon just dirt cheap they're just a 180 um, you get them in a set of four, and two of them come with the uh, attachment flipped one way, and two come with it flipped the other way. Nice. Hmm. Um, and they maybe that should be really your pick of the week. The hey, somebody needs to pick that. That looks. That is, yeah. <laughs> okay, performance. How did it perform relative to the same components on the open test bed? 
it, the CPU actually ran cooler inside the case. That, yeah, that's pretty um, typical. And the GPU was slightly warmer, but not by much, and still very well within uh, a reasonable temperature range. Um, and and that loud, was actually either. with only that was with only two 120 millimeter fans uh, blowing from the bottom as intake. Uh, if you populated all three, I think the GPU would actually run even cooler. So, what's the verdict? I mean, considering the price, the fact you get a PSU with this one, just like in the old days, you buy a case, you get a power supply. What I say at the end of this, and it was actually my feeling pretty early on in my evaluation of this chassis, is this might be my next enclosure as well, um, because it is small. You can you can put it on a desk, and it it's wide, but it still doesn't take up much room because it's not that long front to back um, and it's not very tall, but you can put a lot of high power hardware in this and not worry about having cooling capacity. You could even air cool in this. Although, as I mentioned, if you're going to air cool and you want a case this size, I think you would be better off going with the O11 mini air. Um, because it comes with 200 and I believe 140 millimeter fans in the front and a 120 in the rear. And the sizes are almost identical, but Lee and Lee allows, uh, made it so that you can use an ATX power supply in the mini air. Um, oh, okay. But not the mini. But uh, yeah, if you're doing a liquid cooling build, you could put anything you want in this case and you're going to be able to cool it adequately and it's an easy case to build in and i gave it the gold award and it might be my next case all right let us move to picks of the week and josh will get us started as is tradition okay you know what maybe with these prices rising you should just buy a video card buy down just get it and so for my pick, it's this XFX, XFX Speedster Kick 319. Not the Merc 319. This is the 6700 XT, only for 520 bucks. I mean, that is a, uh, what, $45 increase from MSRP of a 6700 XT. But again, it's overbuilt, slightly overclocked. It's got all those other XFX features that I love so much with the Merc 319. But this one is cheaper. Still got 12 gigs of memory. It's as fast as a 3070 uh, in non-RT applications. Um, yeah, this is a, a nice little product to get if, uh, if you do need an upgrade. And a lot of people do still. Jeremy, yeah. your pick this week. So now I'm not in love with the uh, 6600, but if you're literally desperate for a GPU, like you need more than either AMD or Intel can offer you with an iGPU and you know, the one that you've been depending on for four or five years now did suddenly die because of that overclock you've been doing. And you literally, you know, you can't spend say 500 bucks on a GPU. And this is Canadian, so hopefully you can find it for cheaper in America if you're shopping down there. But seriously, three ninety five for a sixty six hundred core eight gig, it gives you something that is relatively current generation. It's not great. It's not an amazing video card, but it is a ten eighty p mid range card for less than five hundred bucks. Not so bad. I think the instant savings are a little bit exaggerated because it should never be sold for 670 bucks, but you know, 395, that's about, by the way, this, this podcast is not sponsored by XFX. True. <laughs> They've never given me pause anything. For a commercial. No, <laughs> let's pause for a word from XFX, the leader <laughs> in AMD powered <laughs> graphics cards. Merc swift, by the way, is it quick? Check. Is a cute is it kick or quick? I don't know. I said quick is easy. I think it's I said quick. quick. Is it quick? Okay. I I'm gonna say, go with I wish quick. they would use more letters. 
The XT was not on quite as good as a special. It was almost 600 no. which is, no, sorry, you, you don't pay that. For that price, a 6600 is pretty good. Yeah. And it, like if you're desperate and you've got yeah. less than 500 bucks to bowl on a GPU, that's not a bad one. But if you get an extra $20. Yeah, but the, can you, yeah. when, when GPUs were affordable, it was such a mess because there was a new GPU every like 5 to $10. Yeah. But if I just spend twenty dollars yeah. more, but if I spend ten dollars on top of that, you could never decide. Yeah, next thing you know, you get a six hundred dollar GPU that's top end. Yeah. <laughs> You've talked yeah, about yeah, top, top, end, top end GPU for six hundred bucks. Thanks, Josh. Yeah. Look, if you buy yeah, the most expensive you? one, you'll the worst that could happen to you is that you'll end up divorced. But I mean, nothing else. You'll never regret buying it. You'll just I'm sure if I can't with a thousand dollar GPU. The first sort of top-end GPU I... I bought was a seven a GTX seven eighty, mm-hmm. and I want to say it was around five and a quarter thousand. Five twenty-five, and oh, okay. Yeah, of course. My original then, Voodoo graphics was two ninety-nine. Yeah, right. And that that was after the price cut because originally they were offered at like three ninety-nine to four forty-nine, but then mm-hmm. the price of memory dropped dramatically and they were able to cut the card down to 299 that was that was my and then the voodoo 2 was a little bit more expensive than that but not much i remember the mocking the Titan series. 780 well you, you could buy that there. second one in the second days in those old days and it was almost mm-hmm. worth it it was almost was it worth the it. uh was it the uh, 6800 Ultra was one of the first cards to go over a thousand bucks? BFG had a really super version that had double the memory. Um, it was over a thousand bucks. Was it one of those ones that was like SLA'd on the card itself? No, no, that was before. Okay. Those were uh, even available other than the ATA Max, and that was still a five hundred dollar card at the time. Yeah, and that was crap. You wasted your money if you tried to buy oh, that gotcha yeah no it was the titan series i remember mocking for the first time getting over a grand and wanting people to spend it yeah now bfg had a uh, 6800 ultra that was double the amount of memory that the regular wow. 6800 ultra had and it was over a thousand bucks brett has a pick this week I do. You're probably, you know, if you're watching this podcast, you're probably one of those technophiles who arrives wherever you're going with just the right number of cables. However, your friends are idiots and they never bring the right set of cables. So throw a couple of these in your travel bags. It is pretty harsh. Uh, Maybe not idiots. Maybe just like, oh, I forgot, you know, I brought my drone or I've uh, maybe dumbasses. I got my Samsung or my iPhone or whatever. Throw a couple of these in your bag. You got yourself covered. You got your buddies covered. The price is right. It's twofer. You get a twofer, five foot of these cables. For $8, oh, okay. I was hoping that this was one cable. I thought this is the craziest monstrosity I've ever seen. No, it's the twofer. You okay. get a twofer of these. And not only that, and- not only that, but if your friends are acting badly, you can whip them with it. <laughs> you know what? <laughs> yep. This has got sort of that that braided look to the to it where it'll probably hold up to some whipping. <laughs> oh, sure. Yeah, because it has that look to it. Therefore, it must be quality. You know, it has that. Well, well, need to charge my own Blackberry. I, I don't see one for that. Hey, at least it has strain relief on it. Let's it give it has that for eight dollars anodized aluminum enclosure. It has a, surrounding it has a, a camfered edge. Did and then the stress edge? relief. That's what I'm Designed to fit into all kinds of cases. I would call this I, the iPhone 1 color scheme here. I, I feel like you're trying iPhone to make fun of me plastic at the bottom, but it's, the it's not really landing. It's not really, it's not really landing. Uh, yeah. You anyway, seem to be impervious. You don't to think it, it <laughs> not, not today. So look at this type C, they call it iOS, which just is oh, like the lightning. iOS plug. I've never seen that oh, before. For, yes, they, yes. They didn't use the lowercase I. Uh, uh, I know it's I, not, I know. clearly this is not, this is, doesn't have the branding blessing, but it probably Does works. Does that mean it doesn't work? Yeah, who knows? Uh, but at eight dollars and forty six cents, it probably works just fine. Type sure. C lightning cable micro. Anyway, get yourself covered. Get your buddies covered. Throw a couple of these in your bag. You'll never be without the right USB cable Ooh, for eight dollars and forty six cents. Nine thousand bend lifespan. Well, how many times do you bend your cables? Do you even count? 
I have may, not actually tried I it. Say. I have to admit. But look and at this. This is half price it, right now. It's it's aluminium alloy. You did see that, right? When you I had did, that, but that. alloy means they mix it with other stuff. Eh, so is it really what? aluminium anymore? Well, I suppose if you wore them as earrings, they might discolor over a period of time, so let it go. Well, I mean, it's from Oldie Tang, so it's a full mm. Tang anyway. cord. Mm. Anyway, less than nine bucks, two five-foot cords, power all your USB, get on with your life. And if it sucks, just return it, because it's, it's Amazon. Nah, it's Amazon. It's Amazon. They'll take it back. But your buddies will thank you because you can charge their you can charge their drone or their whatever device they brought with them probably. Yeah, their drone. All your Samsung buddies phone. who come over don't bring their drone <laughs> charging cable. All or right, their Samsung phone Tesla or whatever. whatever. Can't save us. Tesla. Yep. <laughs> okay. Well, for uh, my pick this week is the EVGA XR1 Lite capture card. It's a 1080p. Wait, that captures 16- light. Yes, it captures light and passes it through in the form of electrons. It's got 1080p, 60 frame per second video capture, 4K, 60 frame per second pass through. Um, but the trick is you got to get it from Ant Online, um, and it's $47.99 shipped, plus tax probably. But uh, And you just can't beat that price on it for a good quality USB three capture card. Well, you could beat the price, but you need to do it from the privacy in your own home. Mm. Well, you'd need one of those cables that Brett recommended for exactly. yeah. whipping yeah. it. That'd be the flight your friends are not idiots. Your friends are not idiots. They're just dumbasses. <laughs> Have you met my friends? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Someone like you guys. Come on. Ass, but... Oh, wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> my friends hey, are idiots <laughs> at least he has friends I do have, at least there's that <laughs> my pick this I week and I've been I've been trying to stay calm about this but we make jokes about Intel art graphics desktop graphics that sort of thing and I'm not under any kind of NDA so I'm actually going to show it 